like to recognize a, a guest here, yeah. Dean Crass, drove down from uh, Chattanooga area. He's a uh, Saudi Daisy, Tennessee. He's a uh, what PhD biochemist? Is that what you are, Dean? Yeah. yeah. Right. Used to be. Uh, okay. Used to be before engineer. he retired. All right. He's, 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 uh, Okay, and we have a guest presenter who's going to come up and lead off uh, in advance of my presentation, and uh, his name is Michael Palmer. Uh, if any of you have studied First Alabama Calvary, one of the most uh, written about men in the First Alabama Calvary was Lieutenant Joseph Palmer. Uh, that's uh, in his family tree. I don't know if it's a direct descendancy or a uh, an uncle descendancy, but uh, Lieutenant Palmer made friends with um, newspaper men in Nashville, and they gave him some good press throughout the war. Oh. Uh, his primary job was recruiting troops into the First Alabama Cavalry. So Michael has been studying this whole Alabama Cavalry thing for a long time. The list that I've shared with some of you on the spies that General Dodge uh, put together in. Uh, uh, North Alabama, Mississippi, Tennessee, etc., uh, came from Michael's research up at the uh, General Dodge Library in uh, Iowa. And uh, so, uh, with that as the introduction to his uh, 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 particulars and confidence, uh, Michael, would you tell us a little bit about the diary of one of the sergeants in the Union Army, I believe from Ohio, maybe Sergeant Dunn? Yes. And Master Sergeant, I've also seen him at. Come on up with the uh, Joel, when you get ready for the slide, if you don't care, I'll, I'll hit that first slide. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, so uh, Francis Whalen Dunn, he was from um, um, Wayne Township, Ashtabula, Ohio. And uh, he uh, first joined the uh, Illinois unit, the 64th Illinois uh, Sharpshooters, I believe it was. And so, and then he took a, a, a position as a commissioned officer in the 1st Alabama. And so, he kept a daily diary, a journal, from his uh, daily experiences. And so, after he joined the First Alabama, you know, he was keeping this uh, daily journal. And just the uh, the part of his uh, journal that was that was kept while he was in the First Alabama was published in this book by uh, Linda McCorder Todd, uh, "All My Patriotism." And so, you can find his daily uh, journal in, in this book here. So, <clears throat> so they, um, George Spencer, of course everybody knows George Spencer, was uh, wanting to uh, go on this raid, and he wanted to, you know, do a, a grand raid over, you know, and, and do all these things, but everybody had different reins on them. So anyway, they, um, they finally got permission, George Spencer finally got permission, and so he, um, he took off. On October 19th, and so Francis Whalen Dunn was a part of this raiding party to go down to to uh, Selma and tear up some tracks, and that's basically what the, the raid was was all about: was to go tear up some tracks down in Selma. And uh, so on October 19th, Francis Whalen Dunn says we left camp at about 10 o'clock, and uh, Francis Whalen Dunn had a horse that uh, was kind of lame, and he had to borrow a horse and get it shot, and uh, so he was a little he, he had to rush. So he had to borrow a horse from Mr. Smith, and uh, Mr. Smith's horse, Francis Whalen Dunn writes, was not shot on one hind foot, and I went up to the shop to get him shot. And they were at um, Glendale, Mississippi, which was just uh, east of uh, Corinth, Mississippi. And so it was like an outpost, an eastern outpost of Corinth. And so that's where they, uh, this uh, raid took off from was Glendale. And so, uh, Francis Whalen Dunn, he was kind of running behind and the, uh, the uh, ferry was only able to get uh, two shoes on the, on the horse and that's when the column started out. And so uh, Francis Whalen Dunn says, he saddled up and followed and, uh, and on the way down they, they took off south on the road south of Glendale. And uh, on the road he says, we passed the ruins of several houses burned by the Jayhawkers in retaliation for the shooting of two of their men from those houses. And so, uh, and then they, they camped at Pollard's. Now, uh, Pollard's was a mill on uh, near Payton, Mississippi. So if you know where Payton is, there was a mill there. It was called Pollard's Mill. And 
that's where they camped that first night. They camped at Collins. And um, Francis Waylon Dunn says he, uh, they camped at Collins where he drew the potatoes from an oven. So uh, <laughs> apparently he uh, went into the house and took their potatoes out of the oven. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he names two people, Pettis and Steve, and I went down to get something to eat. They got some dried beef and chickens. And he says the woman in the house was going to knock Steve over with a club, but he got the chicken, and they camped there at night and went out and did some more things that night. So um, the trip is already getting started, you know, with uh, for the big bang. You know, they're not uh, moving stealthily. You know, they're just moving down to the countryside and they're not trying to hide their uh, their whereabouts. And so then they wake up the next day at Pollard's and they they travel. Uh, Vincent's Crossroads, he says. He says, we went as far as Vincent's Crossroads today. Wagons all the time behind. Okay, so the wagons, it's already starting out to be a slow trip. The wagons are behind. He says, at noon, Laddie and 10 of us went to MacRae's and found one of his men. MacRae was rich. He owned a large house, two or three stores, and a plantation. And uh, on the whole, Francis Whalen Dunn says, his was the best outfit I'd seen in the South. Most of their Negroes had run away. Some were in our camps, okay? So they moved in the country, and then all of a sudden, you know, these, uh, the contraband starts showing up, and then they become part of the, the entourage. Mrs. McRae said she did not want to see them anymore, talking about the slaves. They are pro-slavery and Union. The McRae's were pro-slavery, but uh, Union people. And uh, he says, we got several recruits new here. So we got some uh, Southern Unionists that wanted to uh, join the, the first Alabama. And uh, Francis William Dunn says, we captured a gun and two uniform coats near here. So apparently they had captured a, some sort of a large gun and, and uh, I'll take it, Confederate coats. And then they say, they stopped to feed at Daniels. And it says, Daniels had robbed some of our men Colonel gave them permission to burn his house. Everything was destroyed. It looked rough enough. Where we camped at night was at a Union Scouts, but when we halted, we thought it was rebel. Corn is very scarce in this country. And so that was October 20. The next morning, October 21, they leave from Vincent's Crossroads, which is what is now Red Bank. They leave Red Bank. And he says the country is getting worse and worse. So they're, they're heading into what you call Bull Mountain country. They're heading south and east, and they're going to cross through what is now uh, Vina and Hodges, and they're on to Hackleberg, basically. If you've ever been through there, you know it's, it's pretty rough country, mm -hmm. okay? And so uh, he says, country getting worse and worse. Went through a piece of woods about 20 miles with only one or two houses. I tried to keep up the wagons and did two of them for most of the forenoon. Finally, one tipped over, and when I started, again, found that one shoe was off and his horse was getting lame. And he says, tonight, fed again from a Union man's corn, but stopped at a rebel house. So when he says they stopped at this house or that house, and they fed from a Union man's corn, but they thought it was rebel, um, you gotta understand, you know, these people uh, were in, uh, if you're, you're a Union person, you were in enemy country. And so you had to be able to uh, look at who was approaching your yard and, and, and present your loyalty based on that. So if you see a bunch of Confederates riding up, you better become a Confederate real fast. You, know? <laughs> <laughs> you see some Union folks riding up, you know, you're gonna, yeah. you know, all hail Abraham Lincoln and all that, you know. <laughs> so, um, so that's what that means. He says, where we camped at night was at a Union scout's house, but when we halted, we thought it was rebel. And so corn is very scarce in this country. And then uh, country's getting worse and worse. And then tonight fed again from corn but stopped at a rebel house. Gray gave receipt for the stuff and uh, they got a sheet that night. And I think they were in Hackleberg this night. They stopped around if uh, they were making about 20-25 miles a day. And I, if you plot it on a map, it's about Hackleberg is where they would be this night. And so they get up the next morning, October 22nd. And they leave what is essentially now around Hackleberg. And then they travel further southeast, and he says, tonight we got to Charlie Hates. Stony and rough country as I ever saw. 
But the cats were sent out and burned Allen's factory. Allen's factory was a, a, a loom or mill on uh, Bear Creek, where uh, Bear Creek is now, and uh, just west of uh, Haleyville. They burned Allen's factory, about $120,000 worth of goods. Factory employed 50 hands, forced getting worse and chains for the sick man who wanted to ride in the wagon. At noon, some accompanying elk went in advance to Underwoods, got several houses and brandy, Negroes, and apples. When we started again, I secured a horse at the same place. One wagon broke down and was burnt before we reached Kate's. Old Charlie lives in a narrow strip of land between two hills so steep that wagons could not go down. How he makes a living, I cannot see. The strip of land is not more than 20 rods wide. Charlie lives in caves outside. Took two wagons for government in the afternoon for hauling corn. So apparently they took two Confederate uh, wagons that were hauling corn. And so this was October 22nd. And on the way from Hackenberg down to where Charlie Cates lived on the Marion County, Winston County line, they um, stopped at Underwood's plantation. Underwood's was in um, eastern Marion County, uh, just south of, of Haleyville and north of what's known as the White House on that road, sort of out in the country there. Excuse me, Underwood's plantation is my family home, my, my family farm, oh. and uh, uh, old man Alex Underwood uh, had a stand there on the Burleson Trace, so uh, he was set up to do business and he was a prosperous man, and they robbed him many times. The Federals did, and but they always seemed to make good on the stuff they robbed him of. Wow. And so, um, yeah, uh, Underwoods. And he was uh, he's mentioned in uh, John Robert Phillips, the reserve, his book. And 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 Francis Whalen Nunn says Company L. At noon, some of Company L went in advance to Underwoods. Now, if you remember, Company L was mainly composed of men who joined um, in September under the bluff. And so those men composed mainly of, uh, of the, comprised most of Company L. So all of Company, Company L was from this part of the country where this uh, unit is now. And, and, and just as a side note, John Robert Phillips doesn't mention anything about stopping at Underwoods or anything about going through that part of Marion County. Well, we don't really know if the, he had already joined up and was riding down with them. He might have been at home on furlough and just made the trip back. I know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and so, yeah, they, um, and then they go on down and they get to this place where Charlie Cates lived. Now, um, I think uh, Francis Whalen was talking about Charlie Cagle. And because uh, Charlie Cagle, lived down there in the Cagle part of the country down there in uh, Marion County. His name was Stuttering Charlie Cagle, and I think you photographed his tombstone recently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just a few weeks ago on the anniversary of his death, actually. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll mention that again. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so then they uh, stopped at Charlie Cates, and, and this is right there on the Winston-Marion County line, right before you get to uh, National Bridge. And so then October 23rd, they wake up and it's raining. And apparently it was a hard rain. They had to burn some of the wagons because the wagons couldn't make it through the mud. And they packed everything onto the mules. He says, uh, we burned the wagons and packed as much stuff as we could on the mules. The rest was left at Charlie's beside pistol and cannon and ammunition. Quite a number of recruits came in. So they had some more Southern units come in intended to get to Jasper, but only got within 10 miles of the place. Stopped at Lovell. I was in advance, and Trammell pretended to be a rebel, and man, my understanding was that in reality. But when the column came up, they said he was a Union man, and they placed a guard over the house. Dr. Stewart, Dr. Stewart was the doctor they had on the trip. He was sick, and they left him at noon. He was too sick to ride. In the afternoon, met Twisteman, uh, shook hands and God bless you. They told us to go ahead. Colonel was sick in the evening. General, uh, I'm sorry, Colonel Spencer was sick. Okay, so it's muddy, it's rainy. Doctor's sick, now uh, <laughs> Colonel Spencer's sick. Okay, so 
these trips have been worse and worse. And uh, so Francis Weatherly Jones was a part of the advance, and he says, uh, the advance went two miles ahead of the column before any notice of halt was given. And then he says, here, I got a fine mare and led her back to the column. Also got a coffee pot, a thing we have a, we have a hard work to get. And he slept in the corn crib that night. So they're only about 10 miles from Jasper. And it's raining, Dr. Sick, Colonel Spencer's sick. They wake up the next morning and Colonel Spencer decides, we're gonna head back to Glendale. And so the uh, Francis Weatherly Jones says, turn back in the morning, a disappointment to most of the men, rain as usual, took up Dr. Stewart on the route in the afternoon. Now this is important right here. This is a minor little detail that you might not notice, but it's very important. He says, you know, they turn around and they're heading back. And he says, in the afternoon, met four rebels face to face. They run and the advance with which I was traveling gave them chase, but did not catch them. Well, now, what does that mean? It's cattle. Yeah. Exactly. Now that is the minor detail that brought on, I think, the uh, battle over at, uh, at Vincent's Crossroads. Yeah, those four, that word, yeah. yeah, those four, those four Confederates, they turned and ran. Now, they just didn't, you know, disappear in the country. They went back up and uh, gave word, and then word got to Ferguson, mm -hmm. and then Ferguson, on, at night now, at 8.30 at night. Yeah. So um, they, they, they knew that the Union Army was heading back, and so they realized, it's our time to catch them. And so, and then they, they go back to Underwoods and Francis Weatherly Sons says, I filled the bag with apples and chickens and got corn for feed. I went two miles further and there camped for the night, had a good supper, applesauce. And so they're out in the middle of the country, somewhere between Underwoods and Hackleberg now. Underwood, by the way, had about six sons that served in the Confederate Army, but he claimed after the war to be a loyal Union man. <laughs> so he's one of those that made an application, David, yeah. for uh, reimbursement. Uh, <laughs> claim to be the only one. Claim to be the only Okay, that was October 24. 24. And that was in the afternoon. It says in the afternoon, that four rebels almost two days face before to face. Two days before the battle. So mm -hmm. they covered a lot more miles going back. You know, per day than they did going down. They took their leisurely pace going down, but they had to do 40 or 50 miles a day coming back in yes. order to be where they were. were. A lot of what, excuse me, what Mike was talking about on Underwood and some, they said, your pretty close ancestors, your yes. distant ancestors. Where would Underwood, that plantation area, be in today? Close to what town or city? It's uh, three and a half miles southwest of uh, Haterville, Alabama. Yeah, Haterville, okay. Yeah, and my dad was born in Underwood's log cabin. Is there anything there that people say about Underwood in that community or something? No. Uh, no. But it wasn't. It's just the forks of the road. It's where uh, the, uh, what's now called the Thornhill Road, which was the Burleson Trace <coughs> uh, original route, uh, forks off, and then the the current road through uh, to the White House area uh, goes to the right. So mm -hmm. I can't remember if you and I or somebody said we're going to make a side trip up in there or not. But it sounds no, we haven't been there yet. Is it still raining or did the rain stop now? Okay. So uh, he says it was raining on October 23rd. Mm -hmm. Okay. And on October 24th, he doesn't say. See any more uh, any more references to rain okay. besides October 23rd, and then October 24th they turned back because everybody was sick and it was muddy, <coughs> and of course you know they just about burned all the wagons by now, and uh, started it on October 25th. They wake up near Underwoods and they start at four o'clock in the morning. So now they're wanting to get out of there, you know, mm -hmm. obviously starting at four, you know, and uh, I guess they know they're in some danger, you know, because the whole trip, they hadn't been trying to move stealthily through the country or hide their, their location. And of course, you know, you go to the Burn Allen factory, you know, they're gonna know. Yeah. Everybody within, you know, 50 miles is gonna know there's an Indian army moving through the country. And so, uh, Spencer, 
I said, you're pretty well beat. You got to get out of there, you know. And they took us and Frank down home. And so uh, he says they started at 4 o'clock in the morning. And he says, God took us straight through the woods. <coughs> so they were near Underwoods. And he says, the guide took them straight through the woods, which and to me uh, implies that they took a different route than what they took. So, you know, there's a main road sort of that goes from Hackleburg over to Underwoods. You know, it's a little country road through the country. So if they took a different route, that means they, they would have crossed uh, Clifton Creek and a little bit north of uh, North Fork Creek. If you they take took a shortcut up to another wagon road up to the woods. Yeah. Or and maybe they were trying to avoid further detection. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's an idea. He says the guy took us straight through the woods. Concealment. And he says we stopped near to Bull Mountain at Wallace. So maybe there was a, a person named Wallace that lived near Bull Mountain. Bull Mountain is just south of. Um, southeast of Red Bank. No, southeast of Belmont. Yeah, south southeast of mm -hmm. Red Bank City. Yeah. yeah. It's over near. It's over near what's that town in Bay Springs? You know, Fulton. I mean Fulton. It's northwest. Northeast. Yeah, it's northeast of Fulton. Northeast of Fulton. Well, basically, in southwest of we got this discussion a lot of detail in the historic house of John. Well, it, it's just three or four miles from Red Bay, and uh, probably thirty miles from Fulton, thirty miles, something like that. But that creek stretches around the, the ridge is there, and part part of that that Bull Mountain is in Mississippi, and part, a lot of it's in Alabama. Like John, so I had to correct, make some corrections on my map. That's what trail goes in. So then uh, they're at Bull Mountain, and then uh, Solomon talked late into the night. Some of the men went two miles ahead to a house. Now, right here he says Waddington's. Um, I think he meant Northington's. There was a, a, fam a Northington family who owned a large um, outfit, I guess you could call it, in Marion County, out in the western part. And so Northington's is what I think he means. Um, this, this journal was transcribed, you know, it was handwritten by Francis Wade O'Donnell, and then uh, it was transcribed by um, Ken Bowen of Milan, Michigan, and he was the one who, who transcribed it and gave it to um, Linda McCord, her father, and so, um, so she could publish it in this book. So, I, you know, I don't know if he misread it or if maybe Francis Wade O'Donnell didn't write it correctly, but uh, Waddington's, he says, but it, I think it means Northington's, and they played smash generally. Francis Wade O'Donnell says they played smash, so they went to Northington's uh, sort of plantation farm, and they smashed up some stuff. <coughs> and so then the next day, October 26th, you know, the big day, they started out at six in the morning, and he says, we heard there were plenty of rebels, 5,000 of them ahead of us at Benson's Crossroads, and uh, we kept on to the crossroads, they did not find any tracks, and they thought it was a, uh, a hoax. You know, they had heard that there were some rebels up ahead. They didn't see any tracks. <coughs> and then he says, uh, four or five miles from there, we found a, a squad of six of them out in the field. Okay, and so that was Ferguson's advance scout. That squad of six, mm -hmm. and uh, they all ran, and that's when they got word back to Ferguson. He says, we fed our horses at Patterson's. Uh, I think Patterson's what is now um, um, Gold, Mississippi. And so yeah, Mr. Michael Murray thinks that I even printed a map off of Google. Patterson's, Patterson's Chapel right in that area, mm -hmm. in between Golden and Red Bay. Yeah. And so, um, and, 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 and here you can get a, a pretty good idea of um, um, George Spencer's. Um, Character, he says, uh, we fed our horse, as Francis Wayland done, he says, we fed our horses at Patterson's. His wife was a rough woman. Spencer told her, we were the children of Israel, bringing the plague on them. <laughs> <laughs> that was bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She didn't get mad to put a hex on them. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, Spencer, and, and over here in another part of uh, Francis Wayland Dunn's Journal. This is when the, they, it's 1864, and they moved over to Georgia. And uh, Francis Wayland Dunn says George Spencer's sick. 
He says, but he's still just as skinny as ever. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, Spencer left Francis Whaler Dunn to guard the cotton. And Barker came down to burn it. And he says, we went two miles. So they go two miles, and that's where Francis Whaler Dunn says, I had knocked out to the front, and several shots were fired. I pushed ahead and found the two guns on the little rise of ground, and the gunners were loaded. And uh, he says, companies F, B, and G had been deployed to the left of the road, E and A to the right, and H was just going in. The road runs north and south. On the right is a narrow field, 30 or 40 rods wide for almost half a mile, only broken by a strip of underbrush about 20 rods through. Companies L and D were put into the open field on the right, at first facing to the east, and then L faced to the north. I and K were in a similar position on the west of the road. C was rear guard. Pack mules and refugees were also to the rear. Their line was also longer than ours. The Confederate line was longer than ours, and they were outflanking us. The two guns were brought back to the house in the middle of the field. Companies E, A, and H were soon driven out, and the Rebs began to fire on companies L and D. They stood the fire for a while and then retreated. I was laying down the fence at the time they began to fire on Company L and had some trouble to get on my horse. This was the only time that I was in much danger. Orders were sent to B, F, and G to fall back, and soon they came carrying. Sternberg was killed, Swift wounded, and Chandler killed. Company L was formed again, dismounted at the little strip of woods in the center of the field. The rebels were now in plain view of the cornfield, but the artillery soon drove them out, and the column then fell back to the length of the field. The refugees tried to get by, and the pack mules were running everywhere. I tried to get the men into shape, and some of them would come, and some would not. At this place, companies B, K, and C were left to check the advance of the rebels. The pack train and refugees had gone on the wrong road, and I went to them. Company I had the advance, but the guide was gone. I found him after a while, and the column moved on at a smart trot. Refugees and loose men of all kinds doing their best to get ahead. Colonel and all of us that cared anything for the regiment were trying to get them to fall into the road. I succeeded in keeping some of them from going ahead of the guns. Half a mile southwest of the field, and just after the guns had crossed a little brook, the advance was fired into. I told the colonel of it, and he came to the front of the column, then took a road going still more to the south. I stayed in the rear of the guns and did what I could to keep the men back. About this time, the rebel Rebels charged on the rear, and the companies left there gave them a volley that disabled a great many. I did not see it, but the ad adjutant was there and told me how it was. We crossed an open field and went into a swamp. There the men had to get into shape, for the bushes were so thick that they could not get ahead. At the end of the swamp was a small stream. The men in front and the guns, the men in front of the guns said, up the stream, up the stream. And I went ahead of the guns to the place where they ought to come out, but after getting to the creek, they got tangled, and here the guns were left. We then pushed ahead. Only a short distance from this, the woods became more open, and another rush was made for the front. At this point, Captain Shirtless came ahead. McWright with him, and tried to get the men to halt. He told the colonel the guns had been left. Spencer then drew a pistol and tried to form a line. As soon as I saw him, I whirled my horse and called the men that I knew to help form the line, but there was no use. They had heard a few shots in the right and then spread each side of the colonel. And they had heard a few shots in the right and then spread out each side of the colonel. And when I turned, I could not see him, but the men had divided into two streams. The left-hand one was headed by the colonel's guide, and I went with that division. We had only gone a short distance when ten balls were fired from the right and rear of us. Several men are believed to have been killed at this place. Lieutenant Perry among the rest. He and Trammell had both acted bravely in the field, encouraging the men to hold their ground. Captain Trammell and Ford both passed me. Lieutenant Snelling rode with me quite a ways. I got separated from him at a bridge that we had to cross. We went right into the woods, away from the roads of any kind. Had three or four shots fired at us once after leaving the hill. A man who was shot through the hand and body rode with us six or seven miles and then stopped at a house. After we had gone 15 miles, we were only seven from the field at this point. 
Then we tell our story, guided us to Iuka. We stopped once to feed and then kept on, having heard that 300 had just gone down looking for us. Three miles from Iuka, we halted and fed. It was four o'clock and we had rode 75 miles. And that's all we knew of on October 25th. Hmm. So. Okay, Michael, thank you very much for giving us an introduction. <laughs> Okay, we have a kind of a unique presentation to follow this that will tie into it. This is a presentation that's done by Michael McMurray. Michael is retired from the Dallas Police Department. He's a local native of the Belmont area and consequently uh, He's gotten involved, very involved in this project, which basically has kind of begun coming together a couple of years back. Uh, what the group that are working on the project desire is to get to a point where the battle is officially recognized. There is not a single marker in the area where the battle was fought. Uh, there is kind of no way for the general population to understand what went on there. And so consequently, this is the, the groundwork that's being laid for uh, being able to present that to the public. And hopefully in conjunction with either Shiloh or Car Rent uh, or the Muscle Shoals National Heritage Area, whatever groups are interested in becoming partners in making a Civil War battleground project here, we're laying the groundwork for that, if you will. Now, in addition to the presentation that's here, uh, uh, McMurray has written a 40-page dissertation here that's a white paper, if you will, describing the battle and its particulars and the, uh, the, uh, the nature of the engagement and undertaking. He also has a compilation of, the, uh, of all the casualties, both killed and wounded, uh, for the uh, Union troops as well as for the Confederate troops, but the Feder Confederates only recognize uh, either one or two men died in the battle and only a couple of others wounded. Oh. So most of the casualties were taken by the Union forces and quite a number of them ended up uh, missing in action. So uh, the whole accounting of the manpower is uh, still quite a, quite a mystery. So there's several things that are mysteries here. First of all, uh, uh, Michael Palmer spoke with conviction that Vincent's Crossroads is at Red Bay. <laughs> there are others who will tell you it was 30 miles north of Red Bay or thereabout. Yes, Michael? I think it's in Belmont. It's okay, and, and some think it's Belmont. So there's about... No, we don't live in Belmont. And, and, so there's about three different locations though that people still argue would have been Vincent's Crossroads because that's where the Vincent family lived. That's the northernmost location, the one between Dennis, Mississippi and where the uh, Confederate troops crossed Bear Creek to come to battle. Uh, and then there's the one in Belmont, which there's more of a confluence of uh, roads there. And, and that looks like a logical place that could have been Vincent's Crossroads. And yet there is quite a body of people who believe, and in fact, I think Mike believes, at least as a hypothesis, beginning that Red Bay was Vincent's Crossroads. Before, before there was a Red Bay there, Red Bay and Belmont only came along when the Illinois Central Railroad was built. So they didn't exist as anything but country crossroads back in the day. Well, he and, believes that between Golden and Red Bay, which is around the Patterson South, there just used to be a little Patterson store that was people are verified. Yeah. The grandparents have said that's where it was at. There might be a store there, but my point is until 1900 to 1905, when that railroad was built, is when those towns materialized. And they weren't there until the railroad came. And those were basically places that the train would stop for water and coal. And, uh, uh, and railroads had a pattern of having stops roughly every six miles. And this type of fight went on five or six miles. As many as 10 miles, 10 miles. Uh, as a running fight. So what you've got, 
are several stages of the battle. There was an initial clash which happened at a ridge where the the Yankees, I mean the Confederates had the high ground uh, on one side of the ridge and the uh, the first Alabama cavalry had the low ground on the other side of the ridge. And so when the Yankees looked up, they couldn't see the, what was on the other side of the ridge. When the Confederates looked over the ridge, they see all these Confederates down in the low ground in front of them. So it was very disadvantageous location initially. And so there was initial clash and that clash began to, to wound some people in the front line of the rebel uh, line. So the rebels then moved back, I mean the, Confederate, the Union troops moved back a quarter mile to half a mile and repositioned themselves. The, cat, the artillery moved, the men moved, everything moved, and they were able to hold things off for a while at that second location. Yeah. So then after that, the Confederates began to break through and the Yankees started breaking. And they started going for the woods and many of them apparently had been the route of Bay Springs on several occasions, maybe part of training exercise mm -hmm. or whatever. So uh, even the Confederates expected them to move toward Bay Springs in their attempt to get away. And they sent uh, Moreland's battalion uh, to flank uh, the, the uh, uh, position so that they could get over there and cut them off as they were on the way to Bay Springs. I'll show you that in this next presentation. It's a long presentation, but I'm gonna make it as quick as I can. Hey, Joel, has anybody tried to, to uh, verify some of these locations of farms and houses using the 1860 census? And then, uh, and then uh, there have been attempts, but it's in the early attempts stage, and nobody has done a detailed a look at to try to find every position and explain what could have happened where. So that just has not happened yet. That's that's to come later. What has drawn the attention first is kind of under, trying to understand the battle and what went on. Okay, what shall we talk about? He says, First Alabama Cavalry is supposed to have I don't have the battle in context of the Civil War, battle in context of our local area, what units fought, where did they come from. Again, he's a police detective and he's going to ask all the questions uh, to kind of set up the case, if you will. Exactly what happened, who fought, who died, who was captured, where did it happen, what's our responsibility? And so he provides some context first, uh, kind of after the final Vicksburg campaign, which, as you know, ended in July of, uh, of 1863. And so this is the fall after uh, Vicksburg. And it's also the time that things are beginning to heat up in uh, Chickamauga and the uh, siege of Chattanooga. Calvary raids, Vicksburg campaign. <laughs> okay, this is just kind of some general background. A look at railroads that existed at the time, and this is the Chattanooga to Charleston Railroad in the, in the Chattanooga. It doesn't look like it's continuous into Charleston at this point. Uh, this is the uh, West Point uh, to uh, uh, Montgomery or, and or Selma Railroad that uh, the First Alabama Cavalry was intending to disrupt, and they took their their rail removal tools and other tools to take a railroad apart with them. Uh, Sherman's also moving his uh, troops uh, over to relieve uh, Chattanooga, and he's attempting to rebuild the railroad between Cherokee, Alabama, and, and Tuscumbia, which is in a terrible mess. And so there's this whole series of battles at Barton Station, Dixie Station, Cane Creek, Cherokee Station, Little Bear Creek in this time period. And uh, indeed, uh, the men fighting here, some of which are pulled out uh, under Ferguson's plan to go down and stop the first Alabama from being able to make it back to camp. Okay, result of Spencer's raid and the Confederates attempted to intercept Spencer's raid. Who fought at the crossroads? 
First Alabama Cavalry was ranked for 650 soldiers. Uh, that number is kind of debated. Different people give different numbers. 500 soldiers is what I hear by several of the witnesses who were there. But they also had all this body of recruits that were trailing along behind them, not in uniform, hadn't been sworn in yet. Uh, but nevertheless, they were in the entourage that was traveling. So it was probably 650 uh, people in the entourage. Six so engineers and two artillery pieces in the group. And then you've got Ferguson's Cavalry Brigade, which was 2nd Alabama Cavalry and the 2nd Tennessee Cavalry Regiment. And in route from Cane Creek, Alabama, which is between Barton and Tuscumbia, between K uh, uh, Ferguson left the battle there at Cane Creek and came over to and join the 1st uh, Alabama Cavalry. Moreland's Cavalry shows up, uh, Moreland's Battalion. Uh, these were a group of soldiers that were recruited in the uh, Talbot County, Franklin County area, almost exclusively. So there's, there's a good number of them that are actually from the Belmont, Mississippi area. From the Belmont, Mississippi area? Okay. Yeah. So they kind of showed up and joined the way of Ferguson. Yeah, they were, they were, they were formed up in Roosevelt in August 1863, so it hasn't been a few months. But each one of these regiments are thought to have had about maybe 600 people, so that's about 1,200 there in the two, and then the Moreland's maybe another 300, so you get to maybe 1,500 men, so the range is 1,500 to 2,000 people give for how many troops were under uh, Ferguson. Um, many Alabamians led generally by the officers that were northerners. Uh, that's a picture of First Alabama Cavalry people. George E. Spencer and uh, Osro Dodds. Uh, here's Ferguson. I've got a note to the left of him. He's best known for being the escort guard for Jefferson Davis in May of 1865 as he attempted to escape from Richmond, but was captured by General Wilson's Cavalry in Georgia, yeah. supposedly carrying all the gold from the treasury at Richmond, and so people are still trying to find out where the treasury got buried, and there's a TV program on about the 2nd Michigan Cavalry who may have snuck the gold out of Georgia into Michigan, and uh, there's some rumor that it was put on a barge and suck, it got sunk in the uh, uh, Lake, Lake Michigan. Uh, Ferguson, uh, brigade, a little bit more about that. How the battle come to be. We've just gone through that. Uh, here's my route uh, that they took down to uh, Allen's factory. Uh, the road that they would have taken from basically the Belmont area down uh, to uh, Allen's factory, which is actually about three miles to the west of where Bear the town of Bear Creek is, and the remnants of the factory are still there. When I was a boy, there were lots of little dotted uh, houses. They were little workhouses where the women that ran the uh, the looms to uh, uh, to make the thread and and to put, make the thread and the cloth uh, operated those little stations. So they were made out of brick, though. They were what? No, they were, they, were, they were wooden shacks, and they were still existing in the 1940s and early 50s. It was a textile factory, right? It was a textile factory, and there were three Allen brothers that ran it, one of whom was Lonnie Allen, who became the captain of, uh, of a brigade of uh, Confederate soldiers. Did they make uniforms for the uh, I think they did make some uniforms for the Confederate Army. Right. And that particular road is not shown on most maps, but it was the wagon road and the freight road that they used to take the goods out of Allen's factory and take them up to Iuka so they could get them on the train and get them to market. Hmm. Uh, I've got them showing going south on one of two roads. The one uh, due south of Allen's factory is called the Russellville Road. And the one, uh, if you go a little bit further east, you get hit Hayerville 
and you come down the Byler Road there. Those two roads are about six miles apart. And many times when men would ride up to Underwood's uh, plantation, they would come in from behind the house, he would say. And, and uh, uh, so the, the preferred road may have been that Russellville Road to move south at that time from that, from that point where the factory burned. When they went back cross country, there isn't a logical northwest, southeast road for them to travel. Uh, these roads were the better roads, so they may have skedaddled back up those roads and across. They just dropped the wagons and put the hammer down to get back more quickly. Uh, two light steel guns. Uh, still speculation about what guns they were. Could have been a Woodruff two-pounder gun, uh, which is there, kind of a miniature cabin, if you uh, cannon, if you will. The mom did a lot of research on it. Was two 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 inch balls and thinks they were steel, but I, you know, yeah, steel back in those days was hard to come by. Well, those, those, those are, those are steel steel guns. shot right there. They were steel guns. Yeah, yeah. the guns were steel. The ammunition yeah. appeared to be the stones that had been up my rounded and polished. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, then the We Are Six Pounder, is that for not the engine running gun? Yeah. Okay. Where? Yeah. All right. 45 of those were made and uh, uh, 24 examples surviving at Shiloh, so these could have been the guns they had with them. Could have Mount Howitzer. That's, that's that one. That's Mount Howitzer. That could be right. So, still trying to hone in on that. A federal timeline is some of what we just covered. There's a the Hendon Brothers has also uh, written a book. Yes, they came from. Our book came from notes of the. There were two Hendon brothers in the first Alabama Cavalry from Walker County, and uh, so that uh, information has been incorporated into the study. Um, and we read about that, read in Florida, 25th, let's turn and start back. Um, so these are just some other hypotheses on what the outbound route was and the inbound return route. And uh, so there is a speculation about that. Confederate uh, timeline. Ferguson leaves in the dark on the 25th, pulling out of Cane Creek and rushing over to intercept this cavalry group. So those four guys that were encountered down at, yep. near Jasper have uh, gotten back and given information. And so it is priority to go over and stop them from getting back to camp. So there's some detail here on Mansville, and nobody knows quite where Mansville is, but we're closing on it. it Looks uh, like Ferguson okay. crossed both uh, Cedar Creek coming out of the Russell area, as well as crossing over on the Bear Creek, and then lining up along the Iuka Fulton Road to intercept the First Alabama Cavalry. So. This is just a map that he's playing with. That Dennis Bridge appears the area where he crossed the Bear Creek, uh, coming over into the area. And the old Highway 25 is not shown there. It's between the creek and today's 25, which is that yellow line mm. on the left side of the map. Mm. Uh, here's a kind of a, a look at the timeline of October 26th. So Moreland's battalion was dispatched to get uh, uh, into the federal left flank by way of the Bank Springs Road to try to stop any impending escape. Uh, this map, Vincent's Crossroads, is shown in Red, uh, red Bay, mm -hmm. and that is a possibility, but that's not confirmed. Uh, but uh, in any event, they, when, they, uh, when the Federals were driven back after these first clash and the skirmish after that, they said the running battle went for another 10 miles. And if you take that road, it's about six miles down to Vincent's, down to Red Bay. And so it would have gone for maybe four miles below Red Bay, which would have put them into that uh, Bull Mountain uh, uh, area. Those were potential roads that they could have been sent out on. And in fact, 
I think Borland's brigade was sent down that Highway 4 first and then recalled quickly and came back down, but then maybe went out to Rock Creek Road uh, later on to head off the uh, potential escape that, that First Alabama would have. Correct me if I'm wrong, Basically. I thought Michael and you and I agreed we'd probably use the Moore's Mill Road because that comes off of Washington Street, which is right southwest of where they had the first fight. And we said possibly they went up the Rock Creek Road, but Michael said he didn't like that because of the old road bed. If you don't show any old roads, you're going to go north, but they could have had an old road. Well, we're down in the battlefield flash area here, so I'm mm -hmm. thinking that he had sent them out uh, ahead of that. Uh, well, I thought he went too. Above the battle area. There are a lot of different theories. A lot of people have different opinions. And this is a, a, a first cut initial process to working out those details. That's right. Has a surprise <laughs> advantage. Uh, he, he kind of spots the Alabama group before the Alabamans spot him. And he's kind of spread out and he's on the side of the ridge. It gives him an advantage. And he's kind of set up and then the Union troops uh, set up on the other side, but that downhill location is not good for him. So this has the characteristics of an ambush or semi-ambush, but certainly not a, a, a clear ambush, but has uh, elements of that. Uh, skirmish would be the low end of what happened here. An engagement might be the more ideal thing it would be called, but I'm choosing to call it a small battle. It's already been named a battle. So a uh, small battle is what we want to go with on characterizing what happened here. That rise there is a clearly seen today rise by the house uh, where Clark's house is. Now Dean has been to the Clark house and interviewed the people I believe who lived in that house. Well, it was a relative, descendant of a relative or something. Yeah. Okay. Clark, Clark's don't live there now. Yeah. But he showed me the foundation, what he yeah. thought was the foundation. Okay. okay. So uh, this is the setup of where things were found. Apparently an infield uh, uh, bullet or whatever was found in the, in the area here. Not a lot of artifacts, but some. There's a fellow named Tim Smith, uh, who I was hoping would come over. He's a, he's a Lanny-like uh, metal detector uh -huh. and uh, a guru. This is where Ferguson's great. Uh, Brigade charged through the uh, down the road, through dense woods, and then mountainous country for 10 miles toward the Bull Mountain country, which I think is where they kind of left off. And those that were able to escape that far south, I think they let, pretty much let them go. There's a group of 122 under Sergeant Major Gunn, who we just heard his diary, uh, were led to safety by a local boy who arrived at IUK at 4 p.m. So. The very day of the battle, within a couple of hours, uh, that group had made it up to Iuka. Yeah. And how about who the boy is? Don't camp. know who the boy is. Who's going to make the camp? We haven't heard. George Kellogg's boy. George Kellogg's boy. Is that right? Yeah. Where'd you get that? It's in the diary. Oh, is it? Good. All right. Uh, Colonel Spencer arrived in Glendale with about the same number as above. Uh, that was the next day, though. And several days after that, uh, a number of others began to trickle in. Where was the battle and am I right? Uh, there's a uh, Camp Glendale up there and Camp, uh, Camp Davis, which is their destination, what they're trying to get by to. And I'm simply showing uh, with the blue dots uh, drifting off of the Union guys through the woods, trying to make it back to camp and uh, make it that turn. Some of the guys, particularly those that were driven down and escaped all the way down in Bull Mountain, uh, they must have taken a pretty circuitous path. Uh, Gunnar Phillips' diary will enlighten us a, a little bit more on that in a minute. Uh, Lanny, would you speak uh, about the engagement map here? Well, we've got some other rich, rich detail in the diary that Mike just read from. Yeah, we do. That'll but give us the ability to detail. But it's place of time, though, says. Mr. Spencer uh, was, I mean, uh, Michael was speaking, so just go ahead and mention that's, that's the left blown up. Yeah, the left side. The left side, the right side is where Ferguson troops came across this old road that I found out in this map here from 
the National Archives I've had a long time. Greg knows about him today too, but I talked, there's an old road that was called, that came out even to the east of Little Battle Creek when they joined the old Tuscombe Jacinto Road. And they came, what, what they were doing out of Cane Creek, because that's how they got down there, because on, on the next morning, the 26th, there was gonna be a big, big running fight all the way from Cherokee, I mean, Barton Station all the way to, to Little Bear Creek, and that's when they had the engagement on October, the same day, October 26th and 27th. Hmm. And as a matter of fact, Morland Battalion took that same route. And when Ferguson got, they went down to Cane Creek on the 25th, on the night of the 25th, that General Stephen D. Lee and Roddy decided to send them on this mission. But that Crippled Deer Creek up there, Crippled Deer Town was actually on the Alabama, right on the, on the Mississippi line, and Crippled Deer Creek, though, is over in uh, Alabama side, and Crippled Deer Creek is right north, not too far north, in Conquer County, which is called, uh, uh, Allsboro, thank you, I got no map of Allsboro. It's just anyway, right where the Cane Creek comes in at Cane Creek. But, Morland Battalion had four companies. They were sent up there to attack some Tories that had been reported up there and maybe the first few first Alabama Cavalry troops too. So then on the morning 26, they came down and joined Ferguson down there somewhere north of Belmont, you know, around Dennis or somewhere. And speaking of that old McRae plantation that you mentioned in that book, either Joel or Michael Murray told me it was, it, it was that old McRae plantation was a few, just a, like a half mile or a mile northwest of where Denny says is at, which above Greenville. But anyway, they, Ferguson came on down with his two regiments and, and got across a creek at a ford above what we call, uh, it's right above Randall's Mill or Scott's Mill or what Greg thinks also is Man's Mill. But anyway, that's to be discussed because Man's Mill could have been a, a steam lumber mill instead of a grist mill. Michael thinks it was right at the bank, the edge of the edge of the high ground down below that. But anyway, they crossed at an old ford going north and south, Michael says. And and it came right back down into the IU Propulsion Road. So it went they didn't have to go but a few miles before they engaged the first Alabama cavalry. And the, on the west side there, well I've got the, the larger portion, I mean um, the scale later. I'm not quite sure if uh, the Reds Confederate were forced, but I'm not sure if, if uh, General Ferguson had two sections of batteries or, or what, but that's what I put. And, and of course, the blue down below was woods and trees. There's two, one section of two artillery pieces that were the Woodruff guns or something that, that, uh, that Colonel uh, George Spencer had with the first element. And, and I noted that, uh, I knew they would have to have protection. Even if I hadn't read that book, and jo Joel got rid of donated his book away, so I think Bob and I didn't go to the wrong line. But I knew there was about seven companies in the first Alabama that, that was in that engagement, and they had, they would cover their left flank, right flank, and rear flank. And that was a standard cavalry, Union and Confederate cavalry uh, strategic, because I've got a book at home about the Union cavalry. Union cavalry. That's how they used. That was their general you know, training and how they, their field tactics were, which was smart too. But, but General Ferguson, and it says in his, in his report here that he wanted to send Colonel Moore around to the, the first Alabama's left flank to try to catch them in the rear so they couldn't escape. But it also says that, mentions that if he had to follow my direction, you know, he didn't think they would escape. So apparently, uh, Moore's, Moore's battalion or his, 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 uh, Four companies were his company, yeah, some of his companies didn't get down there fast enough through the wood and stuff, so they weren't, he didn't mention wood, but I know it's a fact, that, so they weren't able to do that, it was kind of disappointing. But then after that engagement quit, then they, they went on down, like Joel said, a quarter to a half mile south, and uh, had another pretty hard clash with artillery. And All right, so they clashed here, they moved a little bit south, yeah, I put two close to those crossroads, right probably. Close to the road goes the base frame. And then, and then the Union began retreating here, right. down into the Bull Mountain area. Now, 
That's kind of forced over there, and that's the yeah, so, so right. watching the hill there, and that's that's that creek that we're talking about, Royal Mountain Creek, that had a hard time getting across. Is there, is there more to this, Joel? Or is What's that? Is there more to the presentation? Yes, go ahead. <laughs> uh, here's the look present day of where the ridge was and where the batteries were, so you can see that there's some industrial buildings, there's a railroad track over on the left side of that, and uh, that's kind of the current day setting of where the initial clash happened. Where is that? That's in Belmont, Mississippi. So this is that's in all, the- That's all Highway that, 25 yeah, about where it is. This is the northeastern part of the town of Belmont. Yeah. Okay. Kind of eyewitness discussion of the battle coming up. Yeah. So I'd like to keep going. Yeah, keep so going. it doesn't yeah, get yeah. too long. He didn't have nothing to do with that. Yeah, okay. Uh, here's the old McClung place they mentioned. So a lot of these places, we don't have the uh, township section range for them. We need that so we can place them exactly where they were. And so that's missing yet. Nobody's, uh, nobody's gotten into that. This is down near the Tishomingo, Etiwamba County line. So yeah. Belmont's a southern mm -hmm. town. I know the, there is uh, some pretty good records at Tishomingo. got these people's names, well, I'd be able to find property. Yeah. Okay. If we uh, make a list of all those names, are you available as a researcher? All right. I'll get my wife to drive me over. That's how you solve <laughs> all problems. Right. All right. Okay. Uh, <coughs> this is directions in the battle. Okay, here's a, let's uh, flip the lights so that uh, the lights keep us from being able to read this. I think this is going to be mostly readable for you, but I'm going to go ahead and read it anyway so that you get the gist of this. I got like four excerpts from the diary of uh, an autobiography of John Robert Phillips, and just remember that it was written in about 1922 or 3, and well after the battle, but these are his recollections. Our first line was down in an old field just north of us in a thicket of underbrush were the rebels and on the right of our artillery. We were placed there to protect our artillery on that side. We could not see the rebs from the underbrush. They were firing into us volley after volley. Some of our company were slightly wounded in that line. Our artillery was busy shelling the road. We had orders to fall back a quarter or half a mile south and were also ordered to dismount and form a line on the right. Our artillery had fallen back also. The rebels then came in sight, and we began to do some shooting in good earnest and held them in check for a while. However, the rebs soon brought up their artillery and began to rain constant shot among us. There is some debate about whether the rebels actually had their artillery with them, but at least this eyewitness account believed that they were raining artillery on them. Now here's a, a, another little segment from his diary. We fell back from time to time, formed lines, and defended ourselves as best we could while retreating. This continued until dark, but a little before sunset, we came to a creek where the road seemed to give out. Here we found our artillery deserted and did not see any way of crossing the stream. The banks were from six to eight feet high and perpendicular. The Rebs were pressing us in the rear, charging us and shooting a continuous volley in the rear. Our men were shouting forward at every breath. I plunged my horse off a steep bank into the creek, and he commenced pawing and trying to go up the opposite bank. I slid off of him in the water and assisted him all I could, and as he went up the bank, I caught him by the tail and went out with him. He may be uh, auditioning for a Hollywood movie. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Lieutenant Emmerich's horse went into the creek a few feet below where mine went in and broke his neck. I do not know what became of Lieutenant Emmerich, as I saw him no more during the engagement. I then mounted my horse and started up a long hill. Everyone that I saw seemed to be excited and confused. Here's another uh, one that hits close to home again for me. It mentions Uncle Sam Tucker who is a relative of mine. He's the brother of my great-great-grandmother. Finally, I came upon a squad of soldiers who had formed a line of defense headed by old Uncle Sam Tucker, a private, he was a 46-year-old private here, 
who was calling to everyone that passed to fall in line. Many were too badly excited to stop, although his gun was pointed in their faces. <laughs> as soon as I saw Uncle Sam in his shirt sleeves and bareheaded, my energy renewed, and I rode up by his side, and I said, Uncle Sam, I'll die by your side. <laughs> Soon all of our men had passed us, at least those that could not be prevailed by us to stop and fall in line. The rebels came in sight in pursuit of us. Uncle Sam gave orders not to fire a gun, until they got near enough for each one of us to get one of them. They were led by a large man riding a gray horse. I took good aim at him, and when the smoke went up, I saw him fall backwards off his horse. I think the whole bunch of us shot at this rev, as everyone I talked to afterward claimed the honor of shooting him. There's only one rev killed, and this might be the one. <laughs> yeah. uh, we then retreated to a good position and waited for another attack and continued until it, uh, this until dark. At one time in making the retreat, my horse ran astride a sapling that lifted his hind legs off the ground and I fell off the right side of him. My left foot caught in my baggage and ammunition bag on the rear end of my saddle with my right hand on the ground. In this condition, I struggled for a while, but finally, regain my position in the saddle. By this time, the rebels were a few yards and shooting at me continually. I just fell over in the saddle and reached after my horse with my spurs and soon caught up with my companion. He got kind of roughed up. Yeah. yeah. So this Sam Tucker again is the brother of my great-great-grandmother. Uh, in fact, I threw in the uh, family tree a little bit. Uh, uh, Simeon Tucker is the grandson of War of 1812 uh, soldier Daniel Tucker and the grandson of Lieutenant North Carolina Continental Line George Tucker, who is the DAR and SAR honored. Uh, he, his, uh, his brother William F. Tucker served in the 12th Tennessee Cavalry and his sister, Prudence Caroline Tucker is a heroine in the hill country of Alabama. Uh, she had a horrendous deal with the Home Guard molesting her, raping one of her daughters, and she uh, uh, ended up tricking the Rebs in a way, but had, finally had escaped. She was making it to the Tennessee line. She had a baby with her that had a, a, a bad cold and she had to put the, her hand on the baby's face so she and her other six or seven kids that were with her wouldn't be discovered by the home guard uh, because they had told her they were coming after her and she could know what was gonna happen based on what had happened to her daughter. So at any event, the baby died in that condition, suffocated, and that's one of the real tragedies. She actually made it though with the rest of the children up to Dyersburg, Tennessee, where she spent the rest of the war as a refugee. Wow. Okay, one last thing from Sergeant Phillips, and there he is in latter years. It was estimated that we did not have more than 500 men in this engagement. The writer had a talk with General Wheeler about this engagement. He said that he had made preparations to capture every one of us, that he knew our number and our whereabouts, and he, but he'd never met his uh, brave and determined uh, set before. To his great uh, surprise, he did not capture a single prisoner. Well, that's not wrong there, at least uh, 40 prisoners, I think, taken mm -hmm. in this engagement. Some 20 odd men were killed, most of them were officers. Going back to when we made our escape, when daylight came, we discovered one of our bunch was a rebel soldier who was trying to make his escape into the Union line, so he remained with us. There were five of us in this bunch, and we were three days getting back to our line. During this time, we were without, without food, passed through large swamps, waded water that was sometimes up to our necks. We had to stay hidden all the day between two roads where we saw hundreds of revs past us. As we got our company, uh, we moved from Glendale, our former camp, to Corinth, and then from Corinth, we moved to the stockade, stockade on the Uno. Uh, that's the Mobile and Ohio Railroad, South Corinth, which was called Camp David. I think this was built by the Rebs before the evacuation of Corinth. 
Okay, so that's pretty much uh, so the you know, detail. How long after the war Phillips wrote all this? Uh, in the 1920s, I believe. So he was a man approaching 80 uh, at the time he wrote this. I think he was about 25 when he joined it uh, or okay. something like that. So, Okay, uh, this just tells what the roster of uh, the first Alabama cavalry contained. He's done some work uh, trying to you know, count for everybody, and it's hard to do. Uh, so, uh, if prisoners of war are missing in action, there's as many as 108 uh, wounded, around 14 killed in action. This is, says 10 or 11. You know, others say 20. Actually, when uh, Ferguson first made his report, he said, "I think we've killed more than 100 of them." <laughs> so. Uh, one tends to be optimistic, particularly when one is uh, winning a battle in a rout. <laughs> he said, that, so, so there are many in the woods and we just can't account for them all, but we think there's a bunch of them out there. Yeah, well, it's pretty close. That. Huh. <laughs> That's a pretty good estimate. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we told it like it was when we were trying to show it to you. <laughs> okay. Uh, here's the... Uh, Confederate participants and casualties. Uh, the only one known to have died was George P. Brown, a private in the 2nd Tennessee Company D. So I don't know if he's the one they all bore down on uh, at one time. He might have been six foot five. Yeah. <laughs> Big target. Uh, that's right. He, he might have been like the uh, Revolutionary War General Cleveland, that weighs about 250 pounds. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, Mike's questions, what route did Ferguson's brigade take to the battle uh, between Cane Creek and Bear Creek? So, uh, Lanny and the maps are doing a, a good job on starting to settle that, the route from the battle, that was the route from the battle <coughs> to Cortland on the return trip, probably pretty close to what they came down on because they were making tracks and going the straightest way they could find. Where the dead buried? Well, we know a lot about the dead and the Union Corps. So we got names of the, of the Union dead pretty much. Uh, we got 11 of them here. And that's pretty much the presentation. So I wanted you to realize that this, again, is a draft mode. But uh, hopefully we all got a, a deeper appreciation and some understanding on battle events.